everybody, Bob Olson here with Afterlife TV. This is where I talk about the big questions you have concerning life and death. You can find this and every episode at afterlifetv.com. Now, before I get to the point I want to make, I appreciate you letting me mention that our sponsor today is the online resource I created after my father died in 1997 which inspired me to use my skills as a private investigator, my full-time career at the time, to investigate the afterlife. I wanted to learn where my father went when he died. Unfortunately, because I didn't know what I know today about psychics and mediums, in my effort to learn about the afterlife from a psychic reading, I was scammed by psychics, even though I was a private eye. My ignorance about how psychics work and what to expect from a reading led me to be ripped off. Now, today, more than 20 years later, I'm an expert on psychics, mediums, animal communicators, and tarot readers, and I've tested and researched thousands in order to create my online resource where you can find legitimate, incredible psychics and mediums. Because I believe that people like you shouldn't have to become an expert on this subject in order to safely get a great reading. And this is why I created and operate daily bestpsychicdirectory.com. Again, that is bestpsychicdirectory.com. Everybody, Bob Olson here with Afterlife TV. Today's subject is, well, I'm just calling it a roadmap to the afterlife. I got souls, pre-birth planning, planning, spirit communication, soul groups, spirit guides. I think we're going to talk about a lot of things here today. I have been introduced to this uh, amazing guest. So many things that I read in her book, uh, I was jumping up and down celebrating. You know it's a good book when I keep stopping my wife, Melissa, and reading passages to her. And <laughs> all day yesterday, I always wait to read these books be right before the interview, so it's right on, the, on my mind. Yesterday and, and even this morning, uh, you know, Melissa couldn't get anything done because I keep reading to her. So <laughs> anyways, our guest is Terry Daniel. Welcome to Afterlife TV. Thank you. That's such a compliment. Thank you. I'm honored. You call yourself an afterlife awareness educator, right? Yes. Um, you're a certified transition guide. I'm curious about what those two things are to you, your definition of those, and how you got there. I know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a story. Well, I got, first of all, I was always intuitive my whole life. I just, that just took it for granted that I had a strong intuitive sense. I was always metaphysical. I didn't come from a traditional background and then discover this stuff. I, I've been interested in this since I was 12. Wow. Um, so that was sort of built in. When I was in my 50s, I had a child who was severely disabled, severely ill. He died when he was 16. During his illness, I found ways to communicate with him telepathically because he lost the ability to speak because of his disabilities. And after he died, he began talking to me in great detail 30 minutes after he died. Wow. And during that period, I was hearing, I was doing deep meditations, really working on talking to guides, just looking for divine guidance. And I was so into my connection with the other dimensions that it became just incredibly comfortable and easy for me. And I was directed to write these books and go back to school and start the afterlife conference. And everything just pushed me in that direction, starting in about 2006. Fascinating start right there. And, um, and I don't want to brush that. First of all, your son's name is Danny, right? Yes. And I just loved when I read that, that's how you ended up with your last name, right? Yes, I changed my last name to Daniel after he died. That was his first name. What a nice tribute. You mentioned several different types of tribu tributes that people can do. Uh, that was one that I'd never heard of before. And uh, first of all, uh, I, I love the name. It's very easy to remember, Terry Daniel. And I'd known about you for years. And then all of a sudden, to learn that, I just thought, oh, what a beautiful thing to do. I, I, I never heard of it. And I think it's a, it was a, a great example of how far we can go with 
remembering our loved ones in spirit. Now, uh, I don't want to brush by. Danny was diagnosed with this rare degenerative disorder at age 10, right? Yes. And then he passed at age 16. Right. And you had said after two years, so when he's 12, he, he now can't even communicate in full sentences. He can understand you. He just isn't able to talk. Yes, it's very much like ALS, and I always thought of him kind of like a computer where the monitor is shut off. So everything's going on inside, but it can't be projected mm. outward, except for telepathically. And one of the reasons I got so interested in studying death and the afterlife was because I was trying to teach him to have a fearless, conscious view of death. And I realize that most children, all children probably in America, their idea of death is what they see on television and video games and movies. It's violent, it's people screaming, it's blood. And granted, some deaths are like that, but I knew his wasn't going to be like that. So I tried to educate him about what death really is so that as a little kid, he wouldn't be afraid. And looking back, I realized that on a soul level, he was the one who was educating me. I learned it all from him. And I also know in terms of soul agreements and why we come here the way we do is this was all a magnificent pattern of perfection for us. Because I, I know for certain that he was here in this condition, in this situation, so that I could be here right now talking to you about this and teaching and doing what I do. Where did you get this idea, though? I, I mean, most people are afraid to talk to their kids about death because most of the us were not taught how to do that we we weren't taught nobody talked to us about death when we were growing up uh certainly no classes in school about that you come along and and here you have this child and instead of avoiding the subject altogether which adults do i mean you know you talk about your father i know lots of people you know don't talk to them about death you know <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah. they could be you know 103 and they're not going to be talking about <laughs> death but I know you had read, you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Had, was this an influence to you? Is this, how did you get this idea to do this? It was a huge influence to me. I read the Tibetan Book of the Dead when I was 19. Whoa. And um, I hung on every word. And I kept thinking, this makes more sense to me than anything I've ever heard about death in the afterlife before. From everything I'd absorbed living in a Judeo-Christian culture, well, as soon as I picked up that book, 19 years old, I said, I know this is what it is. And I think that's how I got started in my whole path of studying theology and spirituality and doing this work. Nothing, as you know, happens by accident. So No, no, exactly. You know, the, path was, the path was there from the beginning. You so well and so briefly uh, explained what the Tibetan Book of the Dead is really all about and how it's supposed huh. to be used. Could you uh, tell us about that? Sure. Um, uh, in ancient Buddhism, still used today, it's a guidebook. So when somebody is dead or very close to death, the priest or the monk will come and read this book. And it basically says, it's a map of where you're going. And it basically says things like, okay, now you're going to this realm. And if you look over here, you'll see some white light. And if you look to the left, you'll see yellow light. And if you look over there, there's some monsters and demons. And it's all mapped out. And so what it does is it guides the soul to make, I hate to use the term, the right choices, but it says, here are your choices. And the soul will very often be drawn to the dimmer light or to the monsters and demons or to the other things that are there. And so the, the priest will kind of try to direct it to always go to the highest states. However, it doesn't make a judgment that the state over here with the demons is necessarily bad because if the soul is attracted to that, it's going there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And there's work it has to be done in that state. Now, those demons are not external. They're your own projections. And so that's kind of like a life review. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear people every once in a while say, oh, I've heard of people who've had near-death experiences and went to hell. And we know what that really is. That was just a very challenging life review. And so the Buddhists know this too. So the place you go where it's dark or scary or demons is your own stuff coming up for you to look at and heal, just like it would in a life review. And people who come back from NDEs talking about scary experiences going to hell are because, and this is true of all NDEs, 
they didn't really die all the way. They just went to the threshold. So they just kind of went to the life review stage and a few other things, and boom, they're back in the body. So nobody can really tell us from an NDE what really happens because they didn't stay there long enough to know. They only know the first entry phase. The mediums and the channelers are the people who can tell us. Well, it's depending on their beliefs, right? Because sometimes they'll yeah. interpret things um, if, if, if they believe in the, in the demons and, and, you know, if they believe in hell, they might interpret the experiences they're having with uh, their clients, with communicating with spirit, to believe that, that that was something that they experienced. But let me just, just <laughs> with, that, with that said, I, I, you know, I'm jumping up and down inside here uh, in the excitement as I was <laughs> throughout the book because you explain that. It's so important. It's such an important thing. And, uh, and that was a very difficult uh, thing that I was trying to talk about in my own book about why we have these uh, hellish near-death experiences. And I said it in my own words, but I pretty much said the same thing. These people came back. It's such an important point. These people came back. You know, They weren't there long enough so that they could change their experience. And, and many of them were, and they did change their experience even before they came back. Uh, and a lot of that is about these people who just sort of called out for help. And calling out for help, in my mind, is that means there's hope. That means you're starting to believe that there's another possibility. And when you think there's another possibility... The way I understand people who have NDEs, you know, you think about something and boom, it, you're there. You think about it being in a field, you're in a field, you know. You think about exactly. being with your loved ones, you're there, right? Yes, and that's what the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and there's also an Egyptian Book of the Dead and a Celtic Book of the Dead, by the way. Oh. And that's what they do, is they make that suggestion that you can think of another possibility. So they say, okay, you know, now you're on level 42 or whatever, and there's this stuff over here and that stuff over there. Go to that stuff. And yeah. the soul will go wherever it wants to go or where it needs to go. The interesting thing about mediums in hell, and I say this all the time, I'm pretty sure you've never heard a medium say, oh, yeah, I, I was talking to a dead person the other day, and he said, help me, I'm burning in hell. <laughs> that just doesn't exist right. in real death, in real deep death. Yeah. You know, but a projection of that does exist in in near death experiences. Yeah, yeah, and like you said, sometimes the life review can feel yeah. feel like hell if you didn't live a very good life. All right, I just want to talk about your book here, "Bracing Death: A New Look at Grief, Gratitude, and God." Terry Daniel, check it out on Amazon. Uh, in the show notes below this video, you will see a link to it, and uh, I'm excited about this book, and I'm so glad that you came out with it. You know, it's interesting, the, the title, Embracing Death, I actually thought about it. I'm like, I don't want people to think it's necessarily just about that. They have to really understand what that means. Tell us about that title. What did you mean by that? I'm not sure I know what I meant by that. I guess I meant, you know, that to not be afraid of death. Yeah. I was doing a lot of hospice work at the time. And it's, um, it's just a matter of understanding that there is no death. Yeah. And so if we embrace this life as we know it and we think it's wonderful, we'd have to open our minds to understand that there are many other forms of existence, that this isn't the only one. And the other form that most people know is called death. And so we want to make it part of our embracing of all experience. Yeah. It doesn't just end with this physical life. You know, I was talking to a young man yesterday, 22 years old, who is a natural born shaman. And he's doing a lot of shaman training. And he asked me this amazing question. He said, is everything that exists on the earth now all there ever will be? Or will there ever be new things? Will there ever be new life forms or new plants? And where would they come from? And I never thought about that before. But what we concluded was in order for new things to exist, the old things have to die. So the only way anything new could ever exist on earth is like, the earth will blow up or you know, nuclear devastation or pollution or whatever will kill everything off and stuff will burn and turn to carbon or whatever happens scientifically and new stuff will grow out of those chemicals. And so death is like that too. Death is just you know, the breaking down of the old to make fertile ground for something new. Yeah. It's never ending. Energy never, ever stops. Yeah, uh, I love that. I, uh, so well said. 
Uh, great question that he had. That was a really wonderful question. I just want to finish off on that. So embracing death, I think it's so important to really emphasize that embracing death, this is a concept about living. And, and so it's not like looking forward to death or, you know, I love death. You know, it's none of those things. <laughs> it's, it's about embracing death so that it changes the way you live. That's what I think your book helps people do by uh, understanding death in the way that your experiences, my experiences have helped us do to not fear death, for one, to understand it a little better. It changes. It changed my life. And I, I can tell by reading your story, it's changed your life by thinking about death differently. And because we both embrace death in the way that you're talking about here, um, it is about living. It's about living differently because of the way we look at death now. We look at dif death differently. In fact, there's the subtitle, right? A new look at grief, gratitude, right. and God. Okay, so we come full circle. Fear of death is at the root of all neurosis. And if you look at human behavior, you can boil everything down to the fear of death. I was, again, talking to this little shaman kid yesterday about environmentalism. And, you know, in, in rabid environmentalism, political activism, and, you know, we have to save the planet. Yeah. Is the fear of death at the root of that? thinking as well are we afraid of the planet dying which is really being afraid of ourselves dying it yeah. really all comes down to the ego's fear of disappearance i will disappear everything i know will disappear that's a big fear that Humans is a big like fear that. and uh, you and i are talking about it a little bit uh before we start <laughs> started this interview perfect and so we're now we're talking about the new consciousness that conversation we had about that continue with that a little bit more and, and tell us about you know this idea that people have about this shift that's going on and that somehow it's um different than it, it has ever been in, in in history a lot of what i teach is different than the new age party line if you will and i do get a lot of criticism for that but people are always walking around saying oh wow we're in this shift of consciousness and we're coming to you know consciousness is raising and we're coming to this new place because humanity is so messed up and the world is so messed up and whenever people tell me about this shift i have to say you know if we were living in the roman empire or in the middle ages or in africa during the slave trade or in you know anywhere we'd be saying exactly the same thing. We'd be saying, wow, life is so messed up. You know, they're crucifying people. There's the crusades or oh, everybody's dying in the streets from the plague. We're living in really terrible times, but there's new hope coming. There's going to be a shift. There's a new religious teacher preaching on the corner. There's a new way of thinking, or now we have books or whatever <laughs> it is. It's absolutely no different now than it ever was in human history. It's the same struggle. It's the ego suffering and, and having these experiences that create conflict and pain, which are absolutely necessary to kick us in the butt and move us to awareness. Yeah. That is how the system works, and that's always been happening, and there's absolutely nothing different going on today than there was in 700 B.C. or 1642 or any other time. Yeah. In history and it's it's arrogant to think that we're so special that we're living in a special time and that we're so special that we can stop that from happening yeah so there's a shift now yes there is the shift is the internet in my opinion now we have <laughs> this amazing tool yeah that um is helping us spread information but there was a time in history when it was the printing press mm. and people learning how to read yeah evolution happens all the time well, that's it. I love that. I also love that, you know, you talk about, I may open myself up to criticism. I do it all the time. And I, I do the same thing. I, and I think it, it takes people who are willing to take that risk to come out with new ideas, to ship, to, to have a paradigm shift. Otherwise, we all just think the same. We're like drones and, and we never grow in that way. Sometimes we're wrong fine you know well you and i'd be the first to admit it you know what i, I said this I, this is what i believed and now i'm wrong this is what i believe uh, well that'll happen but uh people need to share their views about things that are different and and not be fearful of that because it helps other people to open up their minds and think about it as, as well uh I, you know I, I took a big risk with my book i talk about suicide and i talk about murder and i talk about abortion i you know i cover all 
the subjects that I probably, you know, when I was thinking about it, maybe I should leave these out. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I didn't. Um, those are the, those are the chapters that people got the most out of, and I know they have the most depth and I'm grateful for that. Um, and so, and I'm grateful for you that you have the, um, whatever it takes to come out there and, and share your views in a risky way, even though you may receive criticism and you talk about the internet, that's where we're going to get the most of it is right, right there, you know, right in those comments. Uh, <laughs> all right. So let's go back. I want to talk about you that you communicated with Danny, your son, both during the process, the last four years uh, before he passed and 30 minutes after you know, in a whole new way it started. Well, it wasn't in a whole new way, but I wanted you, you talk about the IPS <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to the UPS and uh, tell us what the IPS is and, <laughs> and how it is that you communicate with Danny now. Well, it's interesting. Um, my communication with Danny has changed over the years as all interdimensional communication does. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Danny was a very articulate kid. He always said really funny things. He was great with words, and he was even better that way from the other side. The IPS, he was trying to explain to me how communication happens across dimension, dimensions, and he said it's like the UPS trucks, the uh, United Parcel Service, and they come and deliver packages to your door. Well, the IPS, the uh, Interdimensional Parcel Service, works exactly the same way. Sorry for that sound going off in the back. That's Can't my even hear it. Um, uh, the packages are delivered to your door. You just have to open the door and sign for them in order to receive the messages that are coming. Actually, the open the door and sign for them just came to me just now. You have to open the door by opening a conduit, by doing meditation and, and studying and practicing this to open the door. And signing for it is... I swear Danny's telling me this right now, is making a commitment. I am committed to believing that this is possible. I am committed to signing on the line and putting my name and my life and my work and reputation on the line for my belief in this process. Beautiful. And you're witnessing this live, folks. I never said those words before. <laughs> that just that <laughs> just came. Um, so that's what the IPS is. And I forgot what the second part is. How today do you communicate with Danny? Or, or just how did you do it at the beginning? Whichever one you want to tell us. Well, this is interesting because this is actually the topic of my next book that just came out, Turning the Corner on Grief Street, talking to all the bereaved people who are suffering so much and wanting communication. Just like we were talking earlier about the pain of life and humanity opens a door to wisdom, the pain of grief opens your heart to interdimensional communication. The wound in your heart is not a wound, it is an opening. Mm. And this is a different way of perceiving pain. Mm. And this is kind of like what embracing death is as well. If we can see these experiences as gifts from the divine to open us up to all that is out there trying to come to us, trying to be delivered by the IPS onto our doorstep, everything changes. Our pain is transformed. And so when we're open to this, communication comes easily. It comes to everybody. Sometimes it comes in dreams. Sometimes, you know, we've all heard the person, you know, mom's favorite bird was a red bluebird. And the red bluebird is now coming to my window after mom died. I mean, we hear this all the time. Right. But people don't sign on the dotted line and make that commitment to believing that's real. Yeah. They think it's a coincidence. So they think they're not receiving messages. Yeah. And the favorite song comes on the radio. There's a million of these little things. Um, these are the messages. And it's up to us to make the commitment to completely believing it. The more you believe it, the more clearly it comes. Now, communication changes over time. This is what I'm going to be teaching at the Afterlife Conferences uh, when channeling changes. Um, my communication with Danny is nothing like it used to be because he's gone on to do do his further work on the other side. And he's not as close to me as he once was. He kind of operates in the background. He jumps in and gives me something like he just did a minute ago. But for the most part, he's off doing his thing. And I'm here launched on my path. He was very close to me. He helped me write these books. He helped me go to school and start the afterlife conference. But he's like a teacher. And a teacher 
if you're a teacher in a classroom with third grade kids, you go up to them, you show them how to do the math problem, and then you walk away. Go help some other kids, and you let that kid figure it out. That's what Danny is doing with me now. Mm. And our relationships with our dead people change over time, just like our relationships with live people do. Yeah. I even find, you know, with my father, when I was writing my book, I mean, there was things that were coming out onto the paper that, you know, I felt the same way. Like, okay, yeah. uh, this is not me. I don't know, you know. And I've never claimed to be channeling uh, anyone, including my father. But there's no question in my mind that uh, someone, and I believe it was him, was helping me to write that book. Uh, there's just certain things that come out. And and I love that. I love that you're chatting and all of a sudden, whoop, you know, there, <laughs> there's Danny. Let me make sure yeah. you get this right, Mom. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> say it this way. Beautiful. I And I think so many of us do that and we don't even know we're doing it. I think there's a lot of people who are channeling a lot of things. Their artwork, you know, their writing, their, their, mu- their music, whatever it may be, or just when they're having a conversation with somebody. How many of us, and I'm really talking to the audience here, how many times have you sort of walked away from a conversation, given someone some advice, and thought, where did that come from? I don't, <laughs> I don't even know. That was good advice. I don't even know where that came from, right? And that's all channeling. Would, would you not define it as such? Absolutely. Um, we're all channeling all the time. And the word channeling is a great word because if you think of what a channel is, it's, you know, I think of it in terms of like a, a river or irrigation channel. It's a connection from point A to point B. And when we're here on Earth, and I think I talk about it in that book, um, it's not like we come from source and then get cut off completely and are here all alone. We're like little children at preschool, and this is the school, and the teachers have the phone number of mom and dad at home in case we need them. We're always connected. It's always on. It's like a television. When your TV's turned off, the signals are still bouncing around or coming through the cable or through the broadcast uh, frequencies, and you just have your TV off. But yeah. it's still live. It's still always there, and we're always part of it. Um, Some of us can slam that conduit shut if we want to, anger, blame, um, really limiting religious beliefs, a lot of things can close that down. And so not all of us are open to it, but it's always there if we want it. And the interesting thing about the religious beliefs that tell people you're not supposed to do this or you're not able to do it is if you study the Bible, everybody did it. Yeah, It was the most natural thing in the world. It yeah. wasn't even, I mean, it's mostly the prophets and the sages, but uh, there's a story in the Old Testament where even a donkey is talking to angels. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, they're everywhere. If the donkey We're can part do it. Of it. Yeah, you actually say in here, I can't find it. I wish I, I could. Uh, it was fairly early on, and uh, you you talk about, it's it's amazing how there are so many people in this world who believe in life after death, and yet they, it's hard for them to make the leap into believing that we can communicate with those on the other side. It's funny how we have these different limitations within our belief systems sometimes where we can believe one thing, but we can't believe in another thing. And uh, that's certainly one of them. So many people, and I know a lot of, you know, I think if they're watching Afterlife TV, most people believe in the afterlife, and yet some people draw the line you know, when I have a medium on, they have a they have an issue with it because they just can't believe that people are able to to do such a thing. And I think that probably comes from religion. Do you not? Absolutely. Agree? I was just going to say that's a uniquely Western thing. It's a uniquely Judeo Christian thing. If you look at other cultures, for example, China. Uh, When somebody dies, they build an altar to the ancestors and they leave it up in their house for a year and they put little flowers and things for for the dead people to still be present in the home. Um, In Africa, I just uh, spent a week at an an African grieving ritual that was amazing. And uh, they're always talking to the ancestors. It's called ancestor worship, but the ancestors are on the other side. So that's what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, always they call in the ancestors to be with them in their prayers or, or to help them in their work or, or whatever. Most other cultures completely take this for granted. And it's really interesting if you look at uh, the Day of the Dead, 
in Mexico, which is a Catholic culture and is based on a Catholic tradition, but it's mixed in with the native um, indigenous culture there, they completely believe this. On one day of the year, the veil is thin and the dead people come mm. and they hang out in the village and they stay for 24 hours and you give them food. That's <laughs> yeah. the, the tradition of kids going door to door, dressed like skeletons, getting candy comes from. It represents the visiting of the dead people. So this is widely believed. Yeah. I think the majority of people on earth do believe in this kind of communication. Yeah. That, and the that, rest are just afraid to admit that they do. Yeah, that's, that's right. Exactly. That's right. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to read a little passage from your book here. Sure. It, it's paragraph two. <laughs> so I didn't even get too far before I got excited about something. I'm going to read this because I think it's awesome and it'll take us maybe in a little bit new direction. But I've spent a lifetime studying metaphysics and spirituality, and I believe unequivocally that there are no good or bad experiences only the soul's constant craving for growth and expansion. In this view, illness and death are not experiences to be avoided, but to be embraced with gratitude for the shifting of perceptions and gifts of growth they provide. In a state of gratitude at this level, we accept every experience with love because we recognize it as one of our soul's creations. Even something as painful as the death of a child can be seen as part of a flawless pattern of perfection that moves the family and the entire soul group forward in unexpected ways. For someone to, who has lost a child to be able to write that shows that you have wisdom beyond your age, really. I mean, you know what I mean? This is, this is lifetimes of wisdom that you brought in with you. Um, and uh, here you are, so many other lifetimes preparing you for this. And uh, I just think um, that's, the, that's the leap of understanding that we're hoping for people, is it not? Yes, and again, that whole speech, you know, is about the pain of grief. And that's why the next book that I wrote is called Turning the Corner on Grief Street, because that's the message I wanted to put across to so many people who are grieving, especially if they had a child die, that from the view from space, from the 30,000 foot view or whatever the expression is, um, there are no bad experiences. And when I'm teaching this in a workshop, all someone will inevitably raise their hand and say, well, what about Hitler? You know, I always yeah. get that question. Oh, I know. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Hitler volunteered for a very difficult job for human consciousness. He volunteered to be the bad guy so that we could all wake up one notch further. And another thing that I teach, I think it's also in that book, is about the kaleidoscope. That if you look at everything in the universe like it's on a kaleidoscope and every event that happens... Um, a plane crash, a holocaust, a tsunami, a butterfly landing on a plant. It's just click, one turn of the kaleidoscope. All the little pieces fall apart and get put back together in a different way. The pieces are not separate. They appear to be separate, but they're contained in one unified space. That's how everything in the universe works. So when we back off and we look at it like that, mm. a death a political uprising, an earthquake, a million people die, a plague, whatever you've got, it's just to turn on the kaleidoscope. And the soul is not attached to the form that that life takes on Earth because it recognizes that it's all about the turning of the yeah. kaleidoscope. And yeah. this is useful teaching when helping people work through trauma where they're so attached to the bad thing that happened to them and that's when it gets into forgiveness. Forgiveness really just means the releasing of attachment to the experience, the releasing of obsession with the experience. It has nothing to do with the other person, Incredible. the perpetrator. Incredible. And you talk about Hitler and, and all the people who died uh, at the hands of Hitler. Is there a word for those types, you know, those people? Or are they just part, they're just part of the puzzle? How does that work? I mean... Ah, you know, um, Danny calls them unconditional volunteers. That's what I wondered. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. have that here as one of the questions. I love, yeah. I love that. Uh, explain that a little bit. Well, we're all, first of all, we're all volunteering to sponsor the growth of each other. On a soul level, you know, just look, using Danny for an example. Here comes this kid with this terrible disease. You know, he was in diapers at 16. Um, why would somebody choose a body like that? Hmm. And... In his case, it was because we were buddies up there in the inner life, sitting around the planning table, yeah. 
And apparently I said, well, I want to be a spiritual teacher in my next incarnation. And he said, okay, I can help you with that. And we slap five and, and to earth we go. I think we all do that for each other. And sometimes we come just to do that, we yeah. come to earth. And I think where you've got millions of people who die under a political regime, as a group, they have volunteered for that experience to support the growth, the growth of the collective. Mm -hmm. Because those souls are so advanced that they recognize that it is a collective. Mm -hmm. Now, once we make this decision while we're planning our incarnations, it's no big deal to say, I'm going to come to Earth and I'm going to you know, be in a concentration camp. Once you get to Earth and you're there, of course you forget the view you had when you were not in a body, and it's the worst horrible thing you can imagine. We forget there is that you know disconnect that yeah. happens. If we remembered life between incarnations, we'd never want to incarnate. We'd, we'd never want to be here. We'd want to go back all the time. And what do you say to the you know to, to those people who try to argue this point? Well, I, you know, there's no way I would ever choose that. I mean, I, obviously, you know, I, how do you answer how do you answer those people? There's no way I would ever. There's do no that way to your myself. ego would ever choose that. Yeah. There's no way your body, Jane Doe, living in New Jersey, would ever choose that. But the soul of Jane Doe is not the same as the personality. The soul has a whole different. Uh, list of requirements, if you will. Do you remember in the 1970s, the boy in the bubble? Yeah, yeah. I saw a, a news story about him in 1973, and he was this kid who had to live in an isolation room because he had an immune disease. And I asked myself, even then, 40 years ago, why would somebody be in that body? And that was when I started to really channel, you know, because I instantly got the answer, which is, oh, well, he volunteered so that you could be sitting here watching him on TV right now and ask this question and get this information and be talking about it with Bob Olson 40 years later. Yeah. It's all connected. It's all the kaleidoscope. Why did that kid come into Earth in that body? Somehow, on some level, he chose it. Yeah. It's not random and it's not accidental. That's right. Well, let's uh, expand upon that. Let's see, on page uh, 12, <laughs> still haven't got very far into the book here. Page 12, you write, I know a man whose son died in a train collision at age 16. The boy was a talented actor and compassionate animal activist. The father laments that his son died before he could fulfill his potential in these areas and sees his son death as the tragic waste of a life that could have contributed so much to the world. Um, I hear this a lot about lost potential when young people die, and uh, I think you get a great message for them. And what would that be? Well, there is no such thing as lost potential. You know, those young people who died are contributing even more from the other side. That particular man you're talking about uh, wrote a book. Um, he visited a medium and had n numerous sessions talking to his son, and he wrote a book channeled through that medium from his son. So he now knows that his son is cont continuing to contribute. And when a, a child dies, if the family is doing their spiritual work and paying attention and doing their healing work, they will be raised up, so to speak, and their lives will change. And that soul of that child is still contributing by the changes that he's helping the parents to make. But it all depends how you look at it. I see a lot of parents who are still angry, who have shut down their lives, who have shut down their growth, who have decided that God is punishing them, and that's just where they want to live. And they're not seeing that they have an opportunity to shift their perceptions. Pain has a purpose, and the purpose is to shift our perceptions. And if you don't let that happen, you're going to just be stuck in pain. And while that pain is always a you know, great catalyst for growth, my understanding of the soul is that if that's where the people want to stay, that's an experience as well. And the soul's okay yes. with that too, right? Absolutely, because we can't judge it. You know? So the family that's stuck in anger and bitterness, you know, if they reach out for help, if they come to me for counseling, I will do what I can to help them. But I will also just release them to their path and let them be where they are. You know, it's so frustrating to hear people say, how can I help so-and-so? 
Yeah. And my answer is, you can't. Right. You know, you can present whatever information you have. You can be there with love. You can listen. But then you walk away and you let go. Mm -hmm. And our dead people do that with us, too, which is why they're, that's why Danny's not breathing down my neck all the time. He's presented what he has to present. Now he's going on and doing other things and leaving me to work with it. Yeah. And yeah. that's what they're all doing because we're all still connected. Yeah. And, and I, th right, exactly. And I think, you know, serving as an example is really the best thing anybody can do. You know, I have not lost a child. I can do what I can based on my investigation in the afterlife to pass it on. But there's a lot of people out there who have lost children. They want to hear what you have to say because you know that experience. And you serve as a great example um, of what is possible turning this um this tragic experience into something that we might call growth you know and and maybe getting away from the pain you don't ever really get away from all the pain no i have you know typical human mother pain i have a lot of guilt about things i could have done different you know during his life of course i have pain and i went to that uh african grieving ritual a few weeks ago and i was down there on the floor screaming and crying with everybody else you know doing <laughs> yeah. the ritual because there's there's always going to be pain yeah. You know, yeah. conflict is what makes us grow. I want to say something else about um, parents who've lost children. The whole reason I started the Afterlife Conference was because there's a national organization for grieving parents. I won't mention their name, but they have a very firm rule against talking about any of this stuff. Mm. And they have rejected many of us in this field, you know, including me, uh, Bill Guggenheim, Evan Alexander, many of us. Uh, are not allowed to speak at their conferences yeah. because they feel that talking about after-death communication will upset the grieving parents in their audience because some of them will have received signs and some of them won't, and the ones who think they're not receiving it will feel left out. I was so disturbed when I heard that their policy is to not allow this, this was back in 2010, that I decided to start my own conference so that there would be a place to talk about this, and that's how the afterlife conference came into being. So again, born out of pain, it was so painful to not be able to reach that group because as you say, I have something to give yeah. to those parents. And that's where I thought my audience was supposed to be. Yeah. But I very quickly found out that I wasn't allowed to talk to that audience through the biggest platform that exists in America uh, for them. And yeah. neither do the other teachers. So I had to start my own. That's right. And, and they will find you and, and they have found you. And uh, I was going to give it at the end and we will again, but uh, we'll remind people afterlifeconference.com. Again, all the show notes are going to have all these links uh, underneath this video, but afterlifeconference.com is the place. We move it around the country to enable more people to come. That's great. Beautiful. Afterlifeconference.com. All right. We'll, we'll talk about that. Remind everybody at the end. So we're talking about the last thing we were talking about was lost potential. Uh, I want to take this to the biggest question that I could possibly ask of you. People were asking me this over the summer, promoting my book, and I always thought, oh, how you can't answer this in a, in a radio <laughs> interview, right? Same thing here. But you do such a beautiful job in the book. So I'm going to ask you, how do you answer this question, why does God allow bad things to happen? Uh -huh. uh, your answer seems to begin with a definition of God. So, you know, if you want to start there, fine. However you want to answer it. Yeah, so I have in the book, you know, the question, why would God let this happen? And my answer is, it depends what you think God is. This is very interesting because I'm studying this in school right now. I'm actually in school working on a master's in pastoral care. But we form our image of God as children. And it's usually based on, this is the Freudian view, um, the father, the protective father who provides and punishes and um that's one theory that that's where we get our image of God in the Judeo-Christian world. So that's what people think God is, a protective father or mother that rewards you when you're good and punishes you when you're bad. This is what people are taught in Sunday school. By the time you're five or six or seven years old, this is what you believe. So now you're 37 and some terrible thing happens, like your child dies and all you have to refer to is that Sunday school image of God, you're still thinking like a seven-year-old. And I see so many bereaved parents who are like that. I have one client who thinks that, um, you know, her child had cancer and he died. 
and she thinks God is punishing her because many, many years ago when she was in college, she had an abortion. Ah. And so to pay back for that life, yeah. God took the other life. Yeah. And that's the way a seven-year-old would think in Sunday school. So she never developed her theology beyond that. And most people don't. We're stuck in Sunday school theology because that's what our parents gave us. That's what the culture gave us. By the time you're seven, it's all set in stone mm -hmm. and no one thinks about it anymore mm -hmm. until something bad happens. And then you ask that question. Well, why would the protective father God let this terrible thing happen to me, to you, to anybody? And you can't answer that question if you see it as a protective father God. Yep. You have to change the way you see yep. God. And if you allow that change to happen, your pain will be relieved and your understanding will expand. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the biggest question, I think, in the work that I do, biggest question in the work that you do. I mean, if people can understand that, they can get to that place where they understand that. I'm pretty sure everything else sort of falls into place. I mean, if you get that. And it changes your life because, because when bad things happen to you, you're no longer feeling like a victim. You're no longer feeling like you're being punished or ignored by God. You're recognizing that this is part of life. And um, you, oh, can I find this? Oh, all right, here's a, all right, I'm going to read again. Do you mind? Uh, oh, I love this. I'm very flattered. Thank you. All right, uh, page 95 and 96. Here we go. Read this to my wife this morning. So it starts off, you're talking about if you lose your job, you grieve, you worry, you have fear, and that's okay. The guys would never tell you to judge yourself for being fearful, but they would tell you to be with the fear, to breathe into it, allow it, process it, learn from it, feel it, and then walk through it to the new reality that awaits you. You talk about surrendering, uh, which is really what that is all about, and you, you answer the question, how do you surrender? Uh, you stop projecting. Stop broadcasting fear. Stop everything. Stop trying to survive. Stop working so hard. Just stop. And then broadcast one sentence, one word, one thought of surrender, and it will shift everything. Don't ask to be rescued. Don't ask God to fix it for you. Ask only to see the truth and lesson in the situation. And here's the real trick. You say it with gratitude, with love. Not with fear, cynicism, or anger. You say, I surrender with love. I surrender with trust. I put myself into the arms of the angels, and I will stop and just be exactly where I am. Ah, I got chills right now. I just got chills reading that. <laughs> so Me too. I can't believe I wrote that. It's been a while since I did that. <laughs> Isn't it good. beautiful? You know, sometimes it's <laughs> nice just to have somebody else read your words. You're like, yeah. whoa, hey, that, that's pretty good. That's, that's um, great. That's brilliant. Uh, I, I don't even know how else, uh, how would you add upon that? that? You don't need to. Well, that's, that's a very Buddhist practice, yep. what I was describing there. And um, I learned that what, during the time I was writing my first book, A Swan in Heaven, when I was first beginning to communicate with my son, and I was still in the first year of grief, and I was my heart was very open, and there was a lot of suffering. And I lived in this little cabin on top of a cliff overlooking a river. And I would go out and stand on top of the cliff. And uh, I had done this seminar with Richard Groves where he taught us a word. Uh, it's an Arabic chant called Inshallah. And it means I give it, you know, Allah's will be done. It's a Muslim prayer. And it just means I give it up to God. And I would stand on the edge of this cliff and I would scream, Inshallah. Inshallah, and I would just cry, and, uh, and you just give it, you give it away. And, you know, the Christians say, give it to God, give it to Jesus. It's the same thing. Mm. But um, then you have to be comfortable being with the anxiety. Because when you give it away, it's, you still have it. Yes. You're just releasing, you're clinging to it. And, and this is what Buddhism teaches. Uh, this is what Pema Chodron teaches, a wonderful Buddhist teacher, that it's all about being with uncertainty. Mm. Sit there with your angst mm. and breathe and know that it will pass. You, at some point, you have to stop trying to control it. Yeah. And if you have a Judeo-Christian outlook, then you are going to ask God to fix it for you because that's that protective father thing. If you look at the way people pray traditionally, they're begging God to fix it. 
and here's something that will rub some people the wrong way. You know, it's, it's Christmas time and I was watching some kids sitting on Santa's lap asking for Christmas presents. And I always say this, you know, um, you know how you never see Clark Kent and Superman in the same place at the same time? You never see Santa Claus and the God of the Old Testament in the same place at the same time because they're the same guy. <laughs> and so asking Santa for presents, these little kids are like, you know, and please give me an airplane. And, a, and it's like the way people ask God for presents. I please see. get me this job. Please find me someone to love. Please help me have some money. Um, God doesn't work that way. God is not Santa Claus. And when you stop seeing it that way, you'll end up turning into your own strength and your own connection with spirit to find the gifts yeah. that you're seeking. And they may not look the way you want them to look. You know, you, you have to accept it the way it is. So, for example, in my own personal life, um, I've been divorced for eight years, and part of me would love to find somebody, you know. And sometimes I ask the universe, and I just say, look, if it's the right thing for me right now, I know I'll run into this person at some point. And then I give it up. You know, I still try. Mm -hmm. You know, I still flirt a little and, you know, try to do stuff like that. But you have to trust. You have to accept the gift in the package that it comes in. And you also talk uh, a little bit in Embracing Death about when we ask for something. Let's say we ask for a new career. Well, it's very likely things need to be torn down before they can be built back up, is I'm um, paraphrasing you. But I love that, um, that vision so that, you know, in this case, you might get fired or laid, <laughs> laid off or, you know, how are you going to have that new career? You know, sometimes we need to be pushed into things. A great story about your friend there who, who's with the wrong guy. And uh, <laughs> uh, she has quite a, quite a uh, needs a push. She needs a real push. A friend of mine used to talk about, we hear the whispers at, at the beginning. And then if we keep ignoring the whispers, it eventually, you know, the universe is screaming at us. And, yeah. and that's what happens. But yeah, when, uh, when, you, when, we, when we ask for these things, we have to understand that sometimes things need to be torn down before they get built back up. I, lo I loved how you wrote about that. Well, it doesn't get our attention if it's a whisper. You know, now I think for some of us, when we've really done a lot of spiritual practice, I think we can hear the whispers because we've tuned ourselves into that. You know, I think my mother said it, it starts out as little pebbles falling on your head and then they get bigger and, and then it's a boulder, you know, and the message comes when you do lose your job or you get a serious illness or somebody dies. And it's not a message saying you're doing something wrong and you need to be corrected. It's a message saying your soul has requested something. Mm -hmm. Your ego body doesn't know what that is, mm -hmm. but here's how that request is going to come. So for me, apparently, um, on a level that I wasn't conscious of, I requested to write these books and be a spiritual teacher and do the work that I'm doing now. And the way I got here was through a lot of trauma, including the death of my son. Now I look at it and the, the words I say to my son all the time are, thank you. Thank you for doing this for me. Thank you for giving me this amazing gift. I owe you one. You know, and then I laugh because it's like I've done this for him in many lifetimes. It's a swap. We're doing it all for each other all the time. Yeah, well, and even even in this lifetime, I, you know, I, I'm sure the, the gratitude is coming back at you because because uh, he's working through you. So, you know, you're both, you're, you're a team, you're doing, the, <laughs> you're doing this together. And uh, I'm sure that the gratitude is going both ways. That's another, that's another lesson in itself right there. Is that's recognize. a whole other conversation. Yeah. And it's, you know, one thing about that is I try to help people to see that the perpetrator in your life, the abusive ex-husband or the molester or whoever you have, ultimately through some processes of forgiveness that I teach, um, you have gratitude for them too. Yeah. If it was not for this traumatic event, I would not be blank, whatever it is. And that's how we forgive, is we find the gift. Yeah. Uh, well, that's beautifully said. I, I had so many more questions that I wanted to ask you, but, uh, well, uh, maybe another time. Maybe we can do this again, because uh, you have a lot to teach us. I do want you to mention your other books. Your first book was what? What was the title of it? Uh, the first book is called A Swan in Heaven, and it begins on the day my son died, and it's very autobiographical. It talks about 
his journey and my life at the time and how we started talking to each other across dimensions. And then the second book is the one you have, Embracing Death. Yep. And the third one is called Turning the Corner on Grief Street. And that's um, all about what we've been talking about, about what I call conscious grieving. To right. understand that your losses and your trauma have a purpose and how you can heal by following those little whispers and those messages to see what that purpose is. Yeah. So uh, with that said, uh, the website that people can learn more about your books is danieldirect.net. Danieldirect.net. We'll have that again. All these links uh, in the show notes. And then the Afterlife Conference at afterlifeconference.com. I'm so happy to have you with us today to share all this wealth of wisdom with us uh, that you have learned in your experiences before and after your son's passing. Let's thank Danny, too. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> thank you, angels and spirits and everybody. And, that's right. And, and thank you, everybody, for watching Afterlife TV. Please leave us comments uh, here on AfterlifeTV.com, on our Facebook page. You can, you can write to me on Twitter, even on YouTube. I love all the comments that are, that are left. I respond to a lot of them, as many as I have time for, but I read every single one of them, so I want everybody to know that. So thanks to them. Well, thanks again. And Terry, to you. Maybe we'll be honored with your presence again in the future. Anytime, I'd love to. So that's another episode of Afterlife TV. Thank you for joining us. Please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, or sign up for our newsletter at afterlifetv.com so you don't miss our next episode. See you next time.